studio assigned her to Flesh and the Devil, yet another vamp role she objected to, until she met her new leading man. John Gilbert was a rising star. He had a long background in films. He'd gone into them when he was quite young. And as he progressed, he became a serious rival to Rudolph Valentino. Even men liked him. Uh, he was wholesome, uh, dashing, he was funny. And he was becoming wildly popular. He was a romantic lead like they had never seen before. I had already started the picture. And we were up at Arrowhead on our first locations. And we were trying to get a woman to play opposite John Gilbert in the picture. And when I got back, the studio gave us the okay to go ahead. It was all right to go ahead with Garbo. And it just happened that the scenes we started shooting when we got back were the scenes in which Garbo was introduced to Gilbert at the railroad station. She gets off the train, and he is there, and he freezes. And he dashes across where she's getting into a carriage. And she drops her bouquet, and he picks it up and holds it. And that's from then on, that was the development of their love affair in the picture. Every scene that was, that was I had, I just had a real love affair going for me that was, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't beat anywhere you tried. Clarence Brown had become one of Garbo's favorite directors, making seven of her pictures. Under his direction, she gave a more erotic performance than Hollywood had ever seen. through a door if he was in the room he went white and took a great long breath and then walked toward her as though he were being yanked by a magnet or something an actress told me many years later you know garbo was at her best when she was in love with john gilbert it was like a lamp glowing from within her i know my grandfather never wanted to acknowledge the idea that garbo and gilbert lived together they couldn't have lived together in his mind. If they did live together, no one should know about it. My father ultimately bought the house that Garbo and Gilbert held their secret trysts in. It's a house with a lot of secret entrances and exits. You can go in and out of that house by the most devious means. Gosh, it was a wonderful house full of mystery and romance. I could just imagine my grandfather driving up trying to look for Garbo and Gilbert and finding neither of them in any room of the house. The problem with Garbo and Louis B. Mayer was that they fundamentally misunderstood each other. You start with someone who is an unknown, who presumably owes their whole career to you. And my grandfather was very much of the mind that if I've created the movie for you, I've selected the writer, the photographer, the clothing designer, the editor of your films. I have given you your life. This is my grandfather's feeling. He gave Garbo her life and her career. Therefore, she owed him. She owed him big time. 
Garbo didn't see it that way. When the studio gave her a role she despised in Women Love Diamonds, she went on strike, claiming illness. And she and Gilbert go to industry events together. She literally dances under Louis B. Mayer's nose. But she is not going to show up for work because she's ill. They told her that her work visa would be up and she would be deported. They spread a lot of nasty things about her in the press. And she basically said, fine, I'll go home if you don't want to cut me a deal. And her timing was impeccable. She reported ill, and the next week she showed up at the premiere of Flesh and the Devil, which basically uh, blew out the box office. And she became economically very important to MGM. She represented almost 12% of the studio's revenues in 1926 or 1927. The studio gave her what she wanted, a production of Anna Karenina. But she disagreed with the choice of director and leading man. After much of the film had been shot, MGM gave in and started again with a new director. And John Gilbert. The studio changed the title to read... When the studio realized that they had a real hot love affair on their hands, they did everything they could to promote this, because of course it sold tickets, and Flesh and the Devil was booming in theaters all across the country, and it went on and on, and every time you picked up a magazine, there they were all over it, and finally they started in the press referring to it as Gilbo garbage. <laughs> Anna bids farewell to Vronsky for the last time. Vronsky imagines he is going away with his regiment, a brief parting. Anna knows she has lost him and plans to commit suicide. For his sake, she makes light of the situation. She was the most understated player at that time that people had seen. She seemed to achieve a maximum of effect with a minimum of movement. She knew that the camera would exaggerate, so she chose to modulate her effects in terms of very limited movements of her facial muscles, shoulders, head, and do it with her eyes. 